So we've already looked at this idea that it's a good idea to maximize the margin by training. And we've seen the SPM objective function. Now we're going to look at how to solve the SPM optimization problem. As I mentioned, because of time constraints, we won't actually be looking at support vectors and duals. So that part, you're interested in the, the materials on the class website. So we've seen this objective function. And our goal is to now focus on how this gets solved, how the minimization gets solved. Um, we're going to start off by revisiting convex function and gradient descent, and spend a little bit time, a little bit of time, um, uh, bringing back to memory stochastic gradient descent, and talk about the difference between SGD stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent. And then comes the problem that the Hinge loss is actually not a differentiable function. So we need to think of something called subgradients or subderivatives. That was the question that came up earlier. So putting subgradients together with stochastic gradient descent, we get stochastic subgradient descent. And uh, once we do all that work, it turns out we'll come up with an algorithm, a learning algorithm for SVM that I think is about eight to 10 characters, characters different from both that which is a cool uh, coincidence. So let's uh, let's get there. So we're going to start off with convex functions. How many people have seen convex functions before? Everyone. Okay, I'm not going to ask who has not seen it before. Uh, instead, let's quickly review them because it's uh, it's worth uh, just knowing this. Um, a convex function is one uh, where for every u and v in the, in the domain of the function and for any lambda that's between 0 and 1, we have this property here. f of lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v is less than equal to lambda f of u plus 1 minus lambda f of v. So this is an annoying thing to look at, but let's kind of interpret this. If you have, what is a function? At any point u, the function gives you a number in this case, we have uh, uh, f is a function that produces a real number. So it gives you a number f of u. At a different point v in the domain, you have f of v. Now, you can draw those two things, you get a chord. A convex function, um, one way of thinking about convex functions is that the chord is always above the function itself. What, what I mean by that is, if I pick a point in between u and v, how do I pick that point? I take lambda amount of u and 1 minus lambda amount of v, add them up, I get a point in between u and v. That point is in the domain of the function. So I can ask, what's the value of that function? So it is f of lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v. I can also try to find a point that interpolates this value and this value here. So that point here, the, the, the point in between is lambda times f of u, this much of f of u and this much of f of v. So adding up lambda f of u plus one minus lambda f of u. And what the uh, definition of convexity says is this point that's on the chord of the function is always above the function itself. Okay, and this is true for any u and v uh, in the domain, and it's true for any value of lambda between 0 and 1. This is just like a pictorial definition. I find this to be useful to think about whenever uh, I want to think about convex functions. Of course, whenever you want to prove anything about convex functions, you can't prove it with pictures. Another way to think about convex functions is um, something that's going to be useful for us later, is that no matter where uh, you construct a tangent plane, the tangent lies below the function. Okay, so you can think of a tangent for in a function anywhere. The tangent is going to be below the function. Many interesting functions are convex. Linear functions are convex. X squared quadratic functions are the classic example of a convex function. For our purposes, the function that's uh, interesting is max of zero comma x. This is something that looks like the Hinge loss. That's a convex function. 
there are many different ways of showing that a function is convex. You can use the definition of convexity. Um, you can show that the for, for functions that that uh, operate on just one input, you can take the second derivative and show that the second derivative is positive. For functions which have multiple uh, inputs or functions whose inputs are vectors, you need to take the second derivative. The second derivative of such a function tends to be a matrix, and you need to show that that matrix is positive semi-definite. If that if these words don't mean much to you, don't worry. This is uh, just for your information. But uh, not all functions are convex. Some functions are concave, where if uh, f um, lambda s of u plus 1 minus lambda s of p, when you apply the function, it's greater than lambda times f of u plus 1 minus lambda s of p, then we call that a concave function. Um, if you take a convex function and just tip it upside down, you get a convex concave function. The only function that's both convex and concave is the line or the hyperplane. And of course, in the general case, a random function need not be both need not be either convex or concave. Uh, these sorts of functions are needed. Now, the reason convex functions are interesting and are um, studied a lot, some might say excessively, in the optimization literature is. Um, you know, from calculus, you know that uh, when you want to find the minimum of a function, you take its derivative and you set the gradient to zero, and you find the value of the function. Uh, the, you find the input where the derivative is zero. So that's a necessary condition for the minimum of the function for the for some point x to be the minimum of the functions. For convex functions, this is both necessary and sufficient. If you can find an x where this holds. Then you know you are guaranteed to have found the minimum of the function, which is why convex functions are convenient because if you want to optimize it, you keep trying to find an x such that the gradient becomes zero, and you are guaranteed that you have the minimum. Convex functions are good because uh, this property holds. In fact, this is such a strong argument that the fact that convex functions have this property has so dominated. Uh, lot of empirical uh, work in particular in machine learning that until maybe say about 2014 2015 or at least uh, definitely until about 2010 it was considered to be a little bit wacky a little bit weird if you design a loss function that's not convex so if you design a loss function that's not convex what's the point of optimizing it because we can't actually optimize it with guarantee with this guarantee it took a big sort of a shift in perspective in the community to even design loss functions and classifiers that are not convex. Today, nothing that we do is convex. In the, for example, chat GPT is not a convex function. The loss function that was used to train chat GPT is not convex. Um, but we don't, we pretend that that doesn't matter and move on. But for the purposes of our lecture, we are working on support vector machine. It turns out the support vector machine objective, the same objective, is convex in W. And if you want a fun exercise, you can use those three proper three ways I told you about uh, finding proving that some function is convex to try to prove that this is convex. Now the good news is that it's convex, and in fact, it's not just convex; it's a quadratic optimization problem because W transpose W is quadratic. And quadratic optimization or quadratic programming is a very well studied part of convex optimization. And the earliest version of FPM solvers essentially used ideas from quadratic programming. So it was a good news, bad news kind of situation. The good news is you really don't have to think about using it. It was somebody else's problem, it worked, good enough. The bad news is it was unbelievably slow. So it was not really used a lot. More recently, this particular objective, it turns out, can be solved using gradient descent. You can take the gra sub gradient descent, it turns out. You can take the gradient of this and just minimize it. And that also tends to be slow. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, no, people didn't really think about gradient descent until stochastic gradient descent became popular. <laughs> 
Stochastic gradient descent is a very, very old idea. It's from 1954 or 53, but somehow it was in a different community, so things didn't really pan out. Once SGD became the de facto sort of uh, template for designing optimizers, then uh, it, 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 the, uh, the idea of designing an optimizer for SVM became so simple that it can actually be covered in one lecture in a machine learning class. So that's what we're going to do. But before that, I want to just revisit gradient descent. It's a general strategy for optimizing, minimizing any function, any convex function, where well, it, you can apply this for any function, but uh, um, for now, let's assume that our goal is to minimize this function here. Um, we start with some initial guess, j of w, and remember that the gradient of the function is simply the direction in which that function grows the fastest, increases the fastest. The idea of gradient descent is you compute the gradient that gives you the direction in which the function increases the fastest. You turn around, take a step in the exact opposite direction. So you take a step in the direction opposite to the gradient and you get to a point that may be closer to the minimum. You keep doing this and you keep getting to a point that's closer and closer to the minimum till eventually you run out of patience or you are at the minimum. At some point, you stop. And this is the general idea of gradient descent. If you want to write this as an algorithm, it might look something like this. We have an objective function. I realize I should not have a min here. We have an objective function that is simply it's a function of the weight vector. It is half W transpose W plus uh, C sum over the hinge loss. You initialize your weights to some point in this, uh, uh, in the, to any point. If you don't really care, just make it zero. And then you iterate forever. At each step, you compute the gradient of the function, this function here, and I'm calling it uh, the gradient of J. And it should be the gradient of J at WT. And you update the weights. At each, so you update the weights to be WT plus one, it's simply WT minus the gradient, and you scale the uh, you, 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 don't really, you may not want to take the full gradient step. You are taking uh, the size of that step is controlled by some number r. r is called the learning rate. You've seen this before, right? This should not be uh, shocking. So this part is easy. Let's now look at stochastic gradient descent. The same thing, the same problem that we saw with least mean square regression also applies here. If you want to compute the gradient, of this whole function here. To compute the gradient, you need to sum over the entire data set, which is going to be very, very slow. So it does not scale. So what we want is a mechanism, a, a training algorithm that is much faster. And that gives us the stochastic gradient descent, where imagine that you have a training, uh, a training set uh, consisting of pairs of examples, xi and yi. And for because we are talking about SVM, the yi and in the binary case, we have yi's are minus one one, and the x's are real numbers. So you initialize the weights to whatever you want. The good news about convex optimization is it does not matter where you initialize, you're guaranteed to get to the minimum. So you can initialize it to whatever you want. Let's say we initialize it to zero. And then learning proceeds in multiple epochs. After all the epochs are done, you return the final weight vector. At each step, you pick one example randomly in the training set. Let's call that xi, yi. And you pretend that this example is the only data you have. This example is all the training data you have. If this was the only data you have, you can construct a loss function using that. So your loss function um, might look something like this. So it is minimized. So, so you don't have this, you shouldn't have this minimized here. It is half w transpose w plus c times max of, well, the hinge loss over that one example here. Yeah. The loss, FPM loss says, I want to sum up the hinge loss over the entire training data. If your training data consists of only one example, well, you're summing up over that one example, which is just the hinge loss. So you so you treat that xi yi as your full data set, you compute, you the, construct the loss function. Uh, there's a question on Zoom, I'll get to that after I finish this. Um, you construct the loss function, you compute its gradient, and you take a step 
in the opposite direction to the gradient with respect uh, and then uh, mediated by a learning rate. I'm calling it gamma t this time. And you keep doing this. Then after this, you go back up, you pick one random example. Okay. Maybe you pick the same example. There's some small chance that you pick the same example, but it doesn't matter. You pick a random example, pretend that that example is the full training data. You construct the loss, you define, you compute the gradient, you take a gradient step. Then put that back in to the bucket and then continue. You do this for many, many steps. For the theory to work, you actually need to do this for an infinite number of steps. Um, but uh, we don't have infinite amount of time, so we stop at some reasonable time and we return the final weight. I'll answer this question on the Zoom, uh, on the Zoom chat. Uh, how does the direction in the gradient descent say anything about the margin in SVM? That's an interesting question. Notice that in all of this, in gradient descent, in stochastic gradient descent, I'm not talking about the margin. I'm not saying that, you know, this is going to make the margin bigger or smaller or anything. Because I'm essentially separating out the responsibility of designing the loss function and solving the optimization problem. The loss function, the design of the loss function uh, uh, takes into account all of these things like margin and all that. But once I have a loss function, I can give it to any optimizer because all we need is to minimize this function here. We don't, the, the learner, the, the, does not, the learner does not really care about how to interpret that function. As far as the learner is concerned, it's just some function. It just needs to optimize it. And it's going to do its job. The interpretation that this is maximizing the margin and such things comes from our understanding of the object. Another question on um, Zoom is, does stochastic gradient descent work when the data is all over the place uh, instead of neatly ordered? When an example is treated as the whole data set, but it's noise, then wouldn't the weight vector be updated in a non-optimal way? That's, that's a very good question. So if I treat a random example as if it was a full data set, it's possible that that example is noise and it's just going to ruin the weights at that step. It can happen. But despite that, the theory of stochastic gradient descent says over repeated such updates, these sort of noisy things will cancel out and you'll end up going to the minimum. That's a very cool result. It's a very, very cool theorem that is attached to stochastic gradient descent and it, the, the, it's the math that makes it work. And the, the I'm not going to go over the theory, but basically what they say, the, the theory of stochastic gradient descent says that this algorithm is guaranteed to converge um, to the minimum of that objective function if gamma, the step size, is small enough. And the reason it works, the, the, the whole the theory is essentially predicated on the fact that the objective is convex. Um, to specifically address the question, I'm going to illustrate a difference between uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent in the next two minutes that we have. But there's another question on Zoom. As, as we go forward in the epochs, there's a higher chance we get one of the examples we've already checked. Why do we give ch that the chance for that example to be chosen again? Um, in fact, the version of the stochastic gradient descent that I'm, I showed you here is not the one that we actually implement in practice. The one that we implement in practice ends up becoming looking a lot more like perceptron, it turns out. And I'll talk about, address that uh, point. When I do that, when I get to that, you'll probably see uh, why this works. I want to show this cartoon of uh, cartoon example of stochastic gradient descent versus gradient descent. Imagine that we have this optimization landscape. These are like your, uh, what are these things called? Uh, the, yeah, think of it as a topographical map where the bottom is the valley that we need to get to. And gradient descent takes this neat uh, ordered path through the uh, through this valley. Stochastic gradient descent, on the other hand, when you start off in the same place, need not necessarily go to point to the bottom. There's one step there, and each individual step might actually take the optimizer. Uh, take the, the the weight vector to some place that's not necessarily good, but the cool thing is eventually it ends up getting to the bottom. It may take many more updates than gradient descent, but each update itself is extremely lightweight because it depends only on one example or more likely a small number of examples. 
And that's why stochastic gradient descent can proceed much faster. Okay, I don't think I can talk about sub gradients right now. In the next uh, lecture on Tuesday, we'll talk about sub derivatives of change loss and all that, and uh, compare to perceptron. And uh, don't forget your homework. Um, and there are two office hours tomorrow. You can take advantage of that.